Hello, do you have an ideal combination boiler and the central heating has stopped working? So maybe the boiler is firing up, but your central heating is not coming on. And after a short while, it says pump overrun in the display. Or maybe your central heating is working fine, but you have no hot water. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the most likely reason for this fault and then what you can do to go about rectifying the fault and getting your central heating or your hot water back up and running again. I'll also give you a couple of tips along the way and a few other things you might want to check. So this video is part of my What's the Fault series. So if you're a gas engineer, plumber, whatever you like to call yourself, or maybe you're just interested in boiler faults, I'm going to give you all the symptoms which I came across on this boiler. I then give you a chance to guess what the fault may be. And then of course I'll show you exactly what the fault was and then what I have to do to get the boiler back up and running again. Make sure you stick around to the end of the video where I strip something down to show you what's inside. Right, so let's get straight on with it and find out why we got no heating or no hot water. So here I am looking at this boiler right here, which is the Ideal Logic Plus Combi 30. Now, when I got to the property, the lady told me that she's had no heating or hot water and the boiler was saying pump overrun on the front of it. She's got her hot water set and central heating. Heating is in a sensible position, hot water is in a sensible position, and the preheat is turned off. I've got to be completely honest and say I'm not that familiar with the ideal boilers as much as I am with the Valiants. Obviously, I'd already had a good look inside the boiler and there was no sign of anything obvious wrong in there. Now, the homeowner told me that the programmer wasn't working properly and it was playing up and not bringing the heating on when she wanted it to. So I pressed the button on the front of the relay box and that seemed to be making a click sound. So I was thinking maybe it's working. I would normally just pop off the relay box. So that would then turn the heating off. But you can see it done some tiling in the past and it's kind of tiled all the way around the relay box. So I can't easily remove it. Now all this time the pump is still running and the bullet still just says pump overrun. So I'm still not sure whether the heating is actually turned on or whether it's turned off. I tried running the hot water and that was working absolutely fine, but they still had no central heating. I'm now thinking, what should I do next? So I checked the flow and return pipes and both those are stone cold. I'm thinking, could the PCB be faulty? So I've been in the property for about five minutes now and the display is still saying pump overrun. So what would you check next? So all of a sudden this happens, central heating, radiators 66 degrees, high efficiency, central heating, radiators 70 degrees, high efficiency, central heating. I know the flame's on because the blue light's on and I can see that the temperature is rising pretty quickly. And there we are, the flame's gone off, central heating at 78 degrees, high efficiency, central heating, and now it says 80 degrees. Now, any second now, the board is going to swap to pump overrun. And there we go. There it is, pump overrun. So hopefully all you engineers out there are now saying, I know what the fault is going to be. So just to run through those clues again. So I now know that the central heating is on. The gas valve, the fan, and everything's working okay. Hot water's working okay. I can hear the pump running. And yet we got no flow around our central heating system because our flow and turnpipes are cold. So what is the fault going to be on this boiler? So I'm now almost certain it's going to be the diverter valve, which is stuck in the hot water position. Now a quick test for this is just to remove the motorized head and then use something flat to push in the pin on the diverter valve. That would then push it into central heating mode. And as soon as I did that, I could hear water start flowing around the central heating system. Now what had happened is that diverter valve spindle had started leaking and the water had gone straight into the diverter valve's motor. So I'm shaking the motor valve head here and I can hear water sloshing about inside the motorized head. And here's the new motorized head to replace the one that's full of water. So I thought I'd let you know that this is quite a common fault. So if you do come across these valves with these motorized heads on, you do want to check to make sure that water has not got inside. This is from a different ideal boiler. And you can see literally it is full of water and it's just dripping as this the motorized head. And even if the valves are in a different orientation, so sometimes you find these heads with the valve vertical and the motor is on top, you can still find that they do leak and the water gets up inside the head. So on a service, it's always a good idea just to take the head off and check inside the valve and the head. 
At the end of the video, I'll strip this head down so you can see exactly how it works and what's inside it. Now I've got a choice here. I can either replace the entire diverter valve, also called a flow group, or I use a kit and I just replace the diverter valve head. So I'm going to just use the kit because the diverter valve is working okay and it's just the spindle on the head which is leaking. Now I wanted to let you know that I was given a crazy price for the diverter valve on its own. It was £251 including VAT, whereas the kit was only £78. But on the internet you can find lots of refurbished and cheap copies of this diverter valve. And when you add in the extra time needed to replace the whole diverter valve, using the kit is way more cost effective for the homeowner. So I'm just greasing up the spindle here on the new diverter valve head. I want to try and keep it lubricated and make it last as long as possible. Before I finish the rest of the video, for those of you who don't know me, let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Mark Ballard and I've been a gas registered engineer for nearly 30 years. The aim of my channel is to help you with your central heating and your plumbing. If you find this video helpful at all, then please give me that little bit of feedback by clicking on that thumbs up and that will also help others to find the video. You can click on that subscribe if you like the video, click on the bell if you want to receive a notification and of course share the video with your friends. A big thank you to everyone who has thanked me by getting me a cup of coffee and leaving a donation in my toolbox fund. It is really appreciated and it does really help me to make more videos which will hopefully help you. Oh, and don't forget to check out my website where I've categorized all my videos and I've left links to all the products and parts that I recommend. So I'm just going to clean off the rust mark of the bottom here. So if the valve decides to leak in the future, I'll be able to see if there's some more marks here. Then it's just a case of putting it back in the diverter valve and doing it up. I can then fit the new head. I like to put a bit of grease on the retaining clip and then the electrical plug only goes on in one position so just line that up and plug that on. Now I can refill the boiler with the water and check its operation. So I'm going to top it up between 1 and 1.5 bar and I mustn't forget to open up the flow isolation valve which I closed earlier to stop the central heating water coming out or whilst I was changing the diverter valve. So I've got quite a bit of air whooshing about inside the boiler here. So I'm just going to go to the auto air vent back here and just open up that cap there. Once I'm happy, I've got all the air out and I've got good circulation. I'll probably then close the cap again because they do have a habit of leaking. Now it's all topped up and it's back up and running again. Just remember, you could also find that the diverter valve has got stuck in central heating mode. So they would have central heating, but no hot water. Now I thought I'd just add, I went to a property the other day and a customer had recently topped up their boiler themselves and they closed the wrong valve. So if you get a similar fault, always just check these valves here because sometimes, like I say, someone could have accidentally turned the wrong valve and this homer had partly closed his return valve. So the heating was still working, but it just wasn't working very well. And it's very easy to get confused about what handles to turn as we've got four handles in the same place. Now the diverter valve kit also comes with this extra little part here which goes in the back of the diverter valve. But it's virtually impossible to get to that part unless you strip out the whole diverter valve. As that would take a whole lot more time, my customer was more than happy for me just to fit the diverter valve head. So there we go, that's another job completed. I've got a happy customer because they got central heating back again. Obviously at the moment it's winter and it's very cold. I've also saved her £173 on just the parts alone. And that doesn't include the extra labour which would have been needed if I changed the whole flow group. So just to finish off, I thought I'd just show you what is inside one of these motorised valve heads. So you just got to release these clips all the way around the side like that and then you can take the valve apart. Now you can see on this valve here there's some water marks there so that's why I'm taking this from here apart because it's become water damaged. And there we go. Now this part here just moves up and down and it opens and closes the diverter valve. There you can see that moving up inside there. It'll push the valve into central heating mode or into hot water mode. And inside here we have the electric switches and these just open and close to move the motor into the correct position. Now do be careful if you decide to take this apart because there's little tiny springs in there and it tends to all just twang apart and springs and bits go flying everywhere. Now the motor assembly just comes out of the main body and here's the motor just here. If I want to take the motor off for any reason I can just release these three clips which just hold the motor in place like that and then the motor will just lift away from the rest of the unit. Now we've got some more little springs here these just make the connection 
for the electrics, for the motor. So make sure they don't go pinging off somewhere. Now the motor rotates the wheel, which pushes the head unit in and out to move the valve into either central heating or hot water mode. And you can see the switches clicking in and out as I move this wheel around. Now I thought I'd just add, I've added this little washer just in here and glued it down because these little springs here, again, they just want to twang apart and go flying off into the distance. There's not much to say about the motor. It kind of either works or it doesn't. Now I thought I'd just add, it does depend on the orientation of the motor to where the water goes and how it affects the motorized head. So if this motorized head is horizontal like this, so it sits on top of the valve, then the water tends to go up into the valve and it goes across onto the connections and stops the switches from working. It is possible to clean those connections and get the head working again. If the head is orientated horizontally like this, then the water tends to go in and it goes into the motor and obviously stops the motor from working. Now these motorized heads, they aren't very expensive, only around 50 pounds depending on where you shop. So it's not really worth trying to fix them. Do let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more videos like this. Maybe it's helped some of you younger engineers if you're looking to come into the fault diagnosis business. It can be pretty tricky at times, but also very rewarding also. So that's about it then. So if you want to watch my video on 10 ways to reduce your gas bill, you can click on the video just here. And of course you can click on subscribe. You can click on the bell, give me a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And it's always my toolbox friend. Bye for now and I'll see you next time.